And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight, coming to us straight from the from the land of BC. A man, of, a man of possibly a thousand, possibly a thousand tattoos, and cur and currently, the creator and artist of the of Kaios, a story of blood and stone, which is going to be hitting its um, second issue, Indiegogo, early next month. The one and only, the red man of the temple, Mr. Ryan Cardinal. How you doing what today, man? Up? You good? You good yourself? I'm do I'm doing good. I'm just counting the days until winter returns because, um, while it may while it may have been popularized by Game of Thrones, winter is coming. Oh yes, it is. I know all about it here. Uh, even even in the land of Vancouver, uh, winter does rear its ugly head. So. Oh, um, well that well that in BC, bud. But um. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And the uh, and the and the horror of um, Canucks fans. <laughs> so uh, I've deduced why Canuck fans are so weird. It, it literally has to do with the city itself, and <laughs> it's, the city rains so much that everyone here is bipolar, just like their fandom. I I just I just look at that fandom and I and I, and I see nothing but karma for them rioting after after an early exit. Yeah, that was. And, and the funny thing is, oh, well, first off, let me apologize for any background noise. Uh, I'm at the tattoo studio today, so if you hear any kind of like rumblings or beeps, uh, it's just the outside pouring in. So just give everybody a heads up on that. No, wor no um, worries. I am. I'm under no. I'm under no illusions of this being a professional podcast. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> um, I'm right at home then. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I was going to say uh, when those riots happened, uh, those weren't actually people like from Vancouver. A lot of those people were from outside of Vancouver. They just came in to stir shit up. So. Oh, oh, that doesn't surprise me one bit. I hear the thing. I hear the same thing every time the World Cup goes down. Um, yeah. But the, but there's there's also there's also the fact that I can torture Canucks fans by just mentioning one by just mentioning the name Jim Benning. Mm, I must not be a Canucks fan then. I have no idea who it is. <laughs> he's he's the G, he's the GM, and whenever whenever he whenever his name gets brought gets brought up, it usually is a is usually of an eye roll of, oh god, what did he do this time? <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm uh I'm more of a Edmonton and a Chicago Blackhawks fan. You have my sympathies. <laughs> well. And Edmonton is, uh, <laughs> they might as well be the Canucks at this point, so. Um, if I, if I had a drinking game for the number of times that Edmonton tried to remind me of the, of the, of them kicking ass in the 80s, then I'd probably be dead from alcohol poisoning. Uh, I think you and everyone in your, uh, proxy area would all, all succumb to it, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Get, getting back to saner things, um, yeah, things that we have control over. Yeah, yes, things that we have, things that we have control over, and don't and don't force us to consume copious amounts of alcohol. Well, force us if we if you choose to if you choose to drink that much alcohol, that's on you. Oh yeah, completely. Um, I given given the now. Kaios is v very much wears its manga aesthetics on its um, sleeve, and oh, yeah. what I'd be curious about first is what is how is your journey when it came to getting into manga, and then um, where the writing bug hit you. Okay. Uh, well, we'll we'll start with uh, the whole comic book scene. You know, like uh, everybody else growing up in North America, at some point you're going to read Spider-Man. You grew up with that stuff. Uh, you know, uh, I grew up in the '90s, so very much a '90s kid. And uh, I ended up moving to this place called Kelowna, British Columbia, when I was 17. And when I was there, I was hanging out with my cousins. And then one day we just go to the Blockbuster. And at this point, you know, like we're we're smoking weed, having a couple beers. And my cousin goes like, "Oh, like." Let's go rent some movies. Like, all right, cool. And back in the day, Blockbuster used to have the quote-unquote Japanimation aisle. 
as it was known back in the day. It's really and cute that had, people thought that was the term that was going to that was going to um, take off. Catch on, yeah, totally. And uh, so we go there, and we pick up a couple things, and uh, just some random, you know, like cartoons. Like, All right, let's grab this. And it so happened to be Fist of the North Star. And up until this point, my only contact with Japanese animation was like Astro Boy. And even then, I didn't know what the difference was because I was like, why does this look so good and so much better than all the other Saturday morning cartoons? I don't know, but it's just so much more awesome. Uh, and then, yeah, we ended up watching it and it literally blew my mind because I never expected anything that gory, that violent, that over the top. Like, had no con concept that other countries were doing kick ass things. And then from there, like the floodgates started opening, and like every weekend was like, "Yo, let's go rent some more, let's more of that good shit." Like, <laughs> when it comes when it comes to the, I don't know, I don't know what I only know what the uh, car, what the cartoon what the um, cartoon scene looked looked like in the '90s from my from my point of view as an American, but um, I do I do recall that around around that time, um. There was the bit. There was there was the big. There was the big push to to, to try to try and make um, to try and make Canada into an animation powerhouse at one point. Oh yeah. Um, it. I had. I'd be hard pressed to say it was successful, and I'd and I get. I get. I've always gotten the feeling a lot of that had to do with that with the with some of the um, regulations, like the whole, like the whole. You have to have. You have to have this amount. This particular quota of Canadian programming on. Uh, yeah, there was uh, some law passed in the 80s, I think it was the early 80s, so it was a Canadian content law, and you have to have a minimum of 33% Canadian content on, so because of that, uh, animation blew up, and because of the uh, tax write-offs and stuff that uh, were happening up here, it was a lot cheaper for American companies to license out properties to get them animated up in Vancouver and Toronto. Which, that's not to, that's not to say that... Um... Not to say that that having that kind of thing is a is a bad thing, but um, I'll, but when it comes to that, I'll, I was colored by um, Toon, by the face plant that was Toon Boom. Oh how yeah, a lot, a lot of their stuff. They put out a lot of stuff, but it wasn't very good. <laughs> so yeah, there's there's uh like there's still a really really super strong uh, animation scene here in Vancouver, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of it is geared toward. Uh, children's content, you know, kids' content, and none of it really crosses over to, like, you know, cool shit like, you know, anime. <laughs> yeah. Now, obviously, there's exceptions, like the team that's handling the Castlevania, the team that's hand handling the Castlevania anime, I believe those guys were in, Vancou were in Vancouver. Uh, I actually almost uh, got on to do storyboards for season one. Oh. Yeah, uh, this was uh, right after I quit tattooing, uh, I went into storyboards and a good friend of mine, he was trying out for it. And he was like, yo, man, uh, I got to hook up on a cool thing that's coming along if you want in on it. And I was just like, well, what, what is it? And he's like, I can't tell you, I can only show you. And what I could show you, I could only show you so much because back then everything was like super under wraps. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's like, I can't tell you what it is, but I can, you know, show you the script and what it is. And I was like, man, whatever this is, this looks really really freaking cool and i was like this this tastes familiar this smells like something i know and then you know flash forward it was like oh i was well, you know i almost tried out for the castlevania role but the thing was this was one of my first storyboard gigs that i would have taken and i would have got thrown right into the deepest of deep ends and i was like yo i ain't ready for that right now yeah i can understand that um but would would you say would you but it's interesting that you mentioned Fist of the North Star or Hokuto no Ken for the purists out there, because that name because that name is a bit of a mistranslation. Um, was your was your entry point? Because I can definitely see a lot of that DNA within this, especially 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 given the world that it's taking place in. Um, were there any other were there any other manga that you had that you had delved into that also that also served as major inspiration for Kaios. Um, let's see. So uh, delving into it, uh, the real breakthrough that happened for me was actually uh, Akira. Like uh, that, watching watching the the anime first, and then finding out that there's like uh, the the manga and 
sussing those out, you know, because like back in the day there was like the, the epic uh, colored versions. Those were the only things that I can get my hands on. So, you know, I'd be scouring the local comic book shops and buying everything I could uh, when it would pop up because I was like, man, this, this story is so much more awesome than the actual anime because there's a lot more to it. So uh, actually getting to read those was freaking mind blowing because I was like, man, the art in this is so good. The pacing in this is so good. Uh, and like he's doing stuff like Otomo and his, uh, his entire team that were working on stuff, like they were able to do things that are very difficult to do, like uh, chase scenes. And it felt thrilling actually reading a chase scene. And I was like, that's, I, I gotta learn how to do this. But uh, unfortunately, my divergent path from actually doing storytelling went into tattooing for literally 20 years. And uh, it all came back around eventually uh, when I decided to quit tattooing and get into animation and then eventually into comic books. Um, when it comes to tattooing, was it a case where, where, you, where you, ended up getting, you ended up getting into that in the process of learning to draw? Uh, I was already drawing well beforehand and I actually got hired by my, uh, the place that apprenticed me because out of anybody that they were going to hire, I was the only guy who could actually draw. <laughs> and yeah, like uh, the funny as it sounds, man, like people will get hired at tattoo shops just for hanging around long enough. At oh. least that's how it was back in the day. Oh, one of one of those kind one of those kind of things, huh? Yeah, like oh, you've been here long enough. You, you know, you've been hanging out, getting tattooed. Okay, well, let me start. Yeah, uh, I'll show you some stuff, but first, you know, clean up everything. You know, we'll teach you that. Uh, but yeah, I got I got picked up just because uh, I was actually selling. Uh, in the tattoo world, there's these things called flash sheets. So it's like, yo, draw me an entire, you know, sheet of paper full of skulls uh, or fairies or barbarians, whatever, whatever it is. So there's a theme to it. And I would go to the shop and uh, my future boss, he'd be like, yo, uh, can you draw me up, you know, a batch of skulls? And I'm like, oh, yeah, uh, what do you need? And he would just buy them off me for five bucks a page. Uh, I'd just sell them copies. I'd keep the originals. And, you know, I'm 17 years old. I'm like, man, I could bang out skulls. I could bang out barbarians. This is awesome. So that's how I got, like, my weed and beer money <laughs> was selling tattoo artwork to my local tattoo shop. And then fast forward, uh, yeah, I ended up getting hired by them. Yeah. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to, the, sto when it comes to the story of um, Kaios, mm -hmm. I'd let... Um... I'd like you to walk. I'd like you to walk me through what, what was going what was going through your head when you were um, when you were first con when you were first concepting the idea. All right. Well, well, this is going to be uh, kind of anticlimactic because there was no like uh, grand plan. I was literally sitting in a coffee shop, and at this point, I was about to go into uh, 3D game art and animation. I was I was going to go into school for that, so I had this little buffer period uh, of I think about maybe a month or so before I, I went into school. And I was like, let me go to a coffee shop, one that I don't go too often, new environment, new energy, and let me just sit down and draw stuff that I don't draw. And so I sat down and I was like, all right, uh, let, me, let me just draw something silly. And I ended up drawing this kid. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's got these gloves on, big, big feet, you know, very, very cartoony, very, you know, cartoony anime, I guess. And I was like, all right, what's up with him? I don't know, just draw another character. I was like, all right, what what are things that you don't usually draw? I was like, I've never drawn a chicken before. I was like, all right, we'll draw a chicken. So I draw this chicken. I'm like, all right, well, now, now what? I'll draw this, like, weird cat humanoid. I drew this cat humanoid, and the last thing I drew was this snake. And literally at the last stroke of putting that giant rattlesnake onto the paper, and I stepped back and was like, all right, what's up with these guys? It's like a light switch got flipped on in my head, and the entire story just downloaded into my brain from beginning to end. It was like playing on like high speed fast forward. And I was like, whoa, what is this? This is, whoa, okay, pay attention to this. I gotta, I gotta figure this out. And like, don't forget any of it. And that's how it happened. It literally just popped into existence and downloaded into my mind. Now, one, th one thing that I do find, ver I do find very interesting when it comes to this stuff, when it comes to the style of manga that the style that you're doing is, for one, for one, um, this is a, this is very much leaning into um, fantasy trappings, which while I've, while, I've, while there's been plenty of there's been plenty of manga inspired projects in terms of in terms of fantasy manga that seem that seems to be 
a bit of a rarity these days, just on, bo on both sides of the ocean. Um, and also, unless I'm, unless I'm misreading it, um, one of the other things that you're leaning into is psychics. Um, was the, was the whole psychic thing a, a, um, a part of that part of, um, your experiences with Akira, or was it something else? Uh, the, the psychic side actually still leans heavily into the magic aspect. That's just a form of magic. But, uh, the abilities that are being used by the characters that are in issue one, uh, I would say that's more influenced by, if anything, more Naruto, because some of them have, uh, like, a visual prowess, mm -hmm. and, uh, depending on who they are, uh, the sight and how they see and how they use it will obviously be their, their you know, advantage point or whatever it is that they're doing. Like, uh, one of the characters is uh, Lady Kudara, and when she uses her quote-unquote sight ability, it's able to amplify emotions. And she can see what people are feeling, or she can, like, overload people with, with certain emotions. Uh, uh, she's part of a group called the Scout Elites, and each of them have, like, a certain ability, and together, uh, whenever they get sent out, they've never been able to, like, they always capture their man, so to speak. Because, uh, you know, where somebody fails in one area, there's somebody else who's got to be able to pick up the slack. If somebody escapes, uh, another guy on there, his, his name's Pathfinder. So if somebody runs away, he's able to, like, if he has something, he's able to lock in on them. And he's able to actually visually see where they went, like, even like a streak or a ghost. So. Now... Speaking, speaking of that, whenever, whenever a fantasy setting has, has, the, has the inclusion of magic, it's always important to make clear the way the system works, even if, even if, it's, not, even if it's not something that's explained early on to, again, to a given reader. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, I'd like, I'd like to pick your brain a bit on how, how magic works in the world of Chaos. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So, I suppose the I suppose the first thing that I can that I can ask is, is it something that is ex instinctual, or is it something that there are formulas that have to be that have to be adhered to? All of the above. So, with within the world of Caius, magic is everywhere, and everything can be perceived as magic, generate magic, be used as magic. But just like in the real world, world here, it's no different than, you know, for some people working out. Like everybody can be fit and buff, but that requires time, energy, and effort. And a lot of people are not willing to put that in. The same thing goes for the world of Caius. Uh, you do have, you know, like sports athletes that, you know, naturally gifted. You're also going to have those people. Uh, you're also going to have quote unquote specialists. You know, uh, those are people either born with certain abilities or possibly cursed with certain abilities or part of a cult, group, secret society that's only taught this thing. So uh, in the world of Caius, there's lots of different ways to use magic both as uh, uh, physically in imposing yourself on the world, as well as uh, different variations of like soft magic and influence and stuff like that. Now, when it comes, when it comes to this kind of magic, um, when you describe it as being everywhere, there's... Um, there's two there's two things that instantly come to mind for me with that. One is the kind of um, subtle magic that's a, that's alluded to in one form or another in Tolkien in Tolkien's work, where the, where it's it's there but um, in ver but in very in very small very small ways. The other is the concept of key, or its equivalent in uh, in a lot of sh in a lot of shonen battle manga. Yeah. Um, and I get the feeling you're leaning more towards the latter, but how how similar and diff how similar and different is Caius's version of magic from how he is often used in um, in sh in shonen works? Oh, uh, let's well, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, the, the concept of key is going to be in there. It's just one of the subsets. Uh, but also soft magic is, is also in the world of Caius. Uh, the way that magic flows is there'll be high and low tides of great magic. And depending on the season, if it's a low tide, people will still be able to use magic, but it's not going to be as prominent or strong. Uh, but when a great time of magic happens, that's when things start getting wild, you know? 
you know, power boost and all this kind of stuff. And in uh, the very beginning of Caius, uh, we are in a temporal flux of magic, let's say. Uh, not quite a, a great period, uh, but people that are in tune, that have been around long enough, can, can feel when these waves are coming. Almost like a gravitational wave hitting something. They can get a sense of like, oh, something's about to shift, but depending on the way that the world works out, it may not go that way and it subsides again. So uh, great times of magic can be felt by, by you know, few certain people, so that soft parts there. Uh, but then when you get to like the shonen style, like that, there's going to be energy blasts, there's going to be all that kind of stuff too. Uh, but there's different ways to access that. And uh, depending on who each character is, they'll have many different variations on using it, accessing it, and uh, there's there'll be some like hilarity involved with it too. Cause... <laughs> so, do you remember gummy bears? You ever hear the gummy bears? Yeah. So like their whole thing was they drank gummy berry juice and get powers. So in Caius, there's, there's siphon magic. And with siphon magic, you can create a siphon filter. And with this, if there is some type of magic around, you can like steal and store a little bit of it. And certain aspects of magic, as long as it creates wonder and curiosity, that can also generate a form of, let's say like generated mana that you can siphon. Uh, you know the trick where you like, you put your thumb out, you put your finger over it, and you make it look like your thumb is moving along, and there's a gap between the two? Yeah. So if somebody does that, and nobody knows how it's done, it tricks that person, and their wonderment actually creates a bit of magic. So if a person has a magic siphon on them, they can leech a tiny bit of their wonderment as magic. And over time, once the siphon gets full, it has to reach the top, they can consume that, and whatever latent powers are within them will emerge while that's being processed through their body. Now, with, given the given the fact that you you've talked you've talked about so, you've talked about you've talked about soft magic a few times, um, so naturally the next question I'd have to ask is, where do you draw the line between soft and I guess hard magic? Uh, I kind of view soft magic as uh, the ability to sense. Let's just put it that way, like. Uh, like so the the feelings, uh, the intuition uh, of certain people, and they would have like greater insight to things just just based on that. That's that's kind of like where I hold soft magic in this world. Sixth so, sense. Uh, sixth sense. You know, like uh, you know, like you know that feeling you get. Like uh, I feel like somebody's following me. It'll be amplified, and they'll actually be able to be like they're following me from six feet back. They can actually pinpoint stuff like that. That would be like the soft, soft magic. Is that sensation kind of gets amplified depending on the time of uh, the ebb and flow of the magic. And would hard in that case would hard in that case be actually um, creating effects? Oh yeah, 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 like power blast, key blast, uh, you know, fire, uh, earth manipulation, uh, ghost conjurings, like like. We're gonna fucking be all over the place, and it's gonna be a blast. Now, when I had, when I had mentioned the about whether or not it, whether or not it was instinctual, or if the, if there were if or not, um, you had mentioned all of the above, and that brings me to the question of the idea of um, of rit of rituals. This idea that you have to. Have certain gestures, or use certain, or use certain objects, or the like, in order to utilize some forms of magic. Is that present in this setting? Oh yeah, oh completely. Uh, there's going to be people who their natural ability, like they can use magic, but you know they they can't pull a key blast out, or they can't use a siphon, you know. But through certain rituals or certain things, uh, like one of the characters I have in there, he literally has you know like uh, six gun shooters but he has to enact them in a certain way and activate sigils and symbols on them for them to fire. Otherwise, they just won't work. And depending on the combinations that he uses, will give him different effects and abilities with the six shooters. That, make, that makes sense. Now, you, given that you mentioned that magic is everywhere and the, pres the presence of a, of a chicken on, in the cast... <laughs> um, yeah. Is 
is is magic is the presence of magic something that can uplift um, animals to be more sentient? So in in the world of Caius, uh, the only kind of like real quote unquote creatures that we run across in the beginning are Traeger the chicken, Sissic the snake, and Catmaster Lee. Other than that, everyone that we run across after that is just normal people in the first. Uh, let's see here. Uh, that arc, that arc. Um, uh, I, I would say, yeah, until until the second, the third story arc, and then we kind of get into like demons and stuff like that. So now, you as as I understand it, you are both writer and artist for Kaios. Yep. Yeah. Um, and naturally, that leads me to ask if there's a bit of a chicken and egg situation when it comes to the, de the development of it, of of, um, of doing art and then writing the story around the around the art, or is, or the other way around. So the way that I work the story is uh, literally, like I said, I downloaded in my brain in 2005, and since then, it's just been kind of like here is the entire story, and like a piece of clay, I've been able to shape it and the story arcs just, you know, like, oh, that's that story arc, and that could be segmented over here. Uh, and the way that I view it is kind of like a Christmas tree, and at the very top, uh, like the, the star at the Christmas tree, that is the story. And as we come down, it gets broken into beginning, middle, end, and then I would focus on, you know, the beginning, and they have that branch off. And as that branches off, it creates all the arcs of the beginning, and the spaces in between there is where I actually get to play with the story. So because I'm not bound solely to uh, the writing, I made it so that there's enough flexibility where as long as I get from point A to point B, there's still fun to have within those two points. All right, that that makes sense. And it's, and um, given what you mentioned about branching, especially since um, you uh, you. You have to work with you have to work with sixty four pages for issue one and thirty two pages for issue two. Yeah. Um, how do you make sure that you don't that you don't get lost that you don't get lost in the proverbial weeds when it comes to adding branches and given arcs? Oh, it's 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 fine because like uh, as long as I know where I'm going, it, it doesn't matter how I get there. You know, like if I'm taking the trip from you know one side of Canada to the other, I know where the end is. And as long as we're hitting stuff along the way, that's fine. Even making like a little loop or coming back around on something, that's fine. As long as we end up where we need to end up at a timely manner. So. Probably take a long route just in case you end up dealing with a moose or something. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you, nobody wants to hit a moose. Moose no, always wins. <laughs> no, no, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Um, nobody. I'm pretty sure nobody wants to have a. Nobody wants to have a moose hit them. No. Yeah, funny enough, if you do hit a moose, uh, you're supposed to step on the gas. Is that is that to that to scare them off or something or? No, 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 no. Because if if they're gonna smash into your vehicle, if you if, it, if you slow down, they're going into your windshield. If you step on the gas, then they'll go over the car. No, fair, fair. Um, obviously, the, obviously, moose don't don't come don't come close to Minnesota, but. Um... Some, but sometimes near near boundary waters there will be stories. Oh yeah, well deer are everywhere too. Like deer, are like rats in the forest in some places. Oh yeah. Um, there's been there's been plenty of there's been plenty of stories about that about them. Um, I just have I just have to deal with getting attacked by geese. <laughs> geese are savage, man. They're also dicks. Oh yeah, they they do not care. They'll be all up in your grill. Now, um, when it when it comes to when it came to now, as I, as I understand it, this particular Indiegogo is for issue um, one and two. Um, mm -hmm. When it came um, when it came when it came to when it came to doing issue one at the very least. Um, yeah. What were what were some of the major takeaways that you that you had from the from the experience, and what were some of the big lessons that you had learned? Oh, uh, let's see. So uh, the first one was literally just so I can get my feet wet with it, seeing if I could write the story. And one of the actual biggest hurdles with the story is uh, 
the way that I start the story and the way that it's always been started in my head actually doesn't involve the main characters. It involves a bunch of sub side characters that come back way later on in the story. So for me, that was a big tough thing on trying to get over. And I was like, how do I start the story when I don't actually have the main characters? Like, it's going to screw everything up. Like, uh, I felt, you know, I was putting myself behind the eight ball, all this kind of stuff. And then one day, uh, I was reading, of all things, Naruto, and <laughs> the battle scene where it's uh, uh, Mike Guy versus Madara. And they're building up to the big hand to hand combat. And I'm like, oh man, shit's going to go down. And I turn the page, and it turns into this giant flashback for literally the entire chapter of that that volume. And I was like, oh, oh, it's okay to do that. It's it's okay to write how, write it how you want it, as long as you get to where you need to go. So let's just do that, because that's that was the biggest hurdle was just letting myself have the story play out the way that I meant it to be. I was getting you know the cart before the horse kind of a thing. And it's like, in the end, it's all going to wash out. It's all going to come out in the story, and it is what it is. Which, which that definitely makes sense. Um, were there any, in, were there any instances of of um, something that you wanted to put in the wanted to put in the sto- in the story for the first chapter, but um, f- but it did, but it didn't quite fit at the time, so you put so you put it on the shelf. Hmm. Not that I can perceive of right now. Um, like there's there's a couple little things for issue two that I wanted to put in, but they're not quite that important in the story right now. So I've I've, I've pushed those things off until we come back to uh, a particular character, um, and then it'll it'll help explain and fill in some gaps. But uh, yeah, that character doesn't come back for a while, so. But uh, other than that, no, no, not too much. Uh, like I said, uh, I have everything kind of mapped out in my head, and as long as I'm I'm being able to get from point A to point B and and not getting lost in the weeds, and if I do get lost in the weeds, I'll just pull back and, and be like, what am I trying to do? What am I trying to say? Uh, what's more important? And as long as I make what I'm trying to do as clear as possible to the reader, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Um, when I look at the when I look at the cast. Um... One other th- one thing that I ke- one thing that I keep getting a v- getting a very strong vibe of is a bit of a um, wild w- a bit of a wild west kind of vibe. Um, mm-hmm. Was that was that somewhat in- was that somewhat intentional? A very wild west wasteland kind of approach. Uh, well, I like drawing rocks. <laughs> like that's literally what it breaks down to. So things like the backgrounds, the, the buttes, uh, the big open areas, all that kind of stuff, uh, it just literally breaks down to, like, I really enjoy drawing that stuff. Alright, I, I can certainly get that. Now, the kick... Now, the, I keep saying Kickstarter out of habit. The Indiegogo for uh, for for issue two, for issue one and two, I believe you mentioned that that's going to be going live September 3rd. And, um, uh, how, September seventh. September seventh. My my apologies. Um, That's all good. How how long are you how long are you planning on running it for? Uh, so I'm going to do the 30 day campaign. Uh, push really hard for that, and uh, if we end up meeting the goal, I'm going to extend it for another 30 days after that, and then from there, I'm going to have it in demand uh, until I start fulfillment. And as soon as I start fulfillment, uh, that's when I'll be cutting it off. I, I realize these things are in flux, but um, what would you be ball what would you be ballparking um, the amount the amount of time it'd take it'd take you to to uh, do issue two? Uh, issue two. Now I gotta map all this out too with all my tattoo stuff, so uh, that's that's the bit of the juggling act. So uh, if I because like uh, I, I just did up the first six pages and I blasted through those super super fast. Like it, they just came together really really quick. Um, so if I have that same type of speed, uh, as long as my thumbnails are done, I can average anywhere from one to three pages a day. So I can get this done pretty quick. Uh, but the real balance comes into you know obviously balancing real life and uh, the tattoo schedule because I also have to draw that stuff as well. Uh, but I'm aiming for a. Mm, I gotta say, four to five month t- time frame just to be on the safe side. All right, I can I can get behind that. 
Um, and something, something I can, something I kind of forgot to min I forgot to ask when it came to just hand just handling the handling the setting is the kind of technology level that we're dealing with. Um, obviously, in something like Fist of the North Star, you have a lot of technological stagnation because, well, it's after the bombs have dropped. Um, but what sort of what sort of tech level are we look are we looking at with Kaias? Does it vary from region to region? Is it is it ver is it very um, very ste very steam and goggles in some places? How far how far does it go? Uh, so depending on the region that you're in, some places will just be completely you know void of tech. Uh, some places will be very uh, heavily involved with magic, or there'll be places where it'll be the fusion of both. Uh, like I said, there's a character that has like you know six guns, uh, you know six shot revolvers, and those come from somewhere. So there is somebody making this stuff, uh, and there's there is going to be a part of the story that involves you know somebody who's able to make tech, but because in the world of magic, it just doesn't work the way that it should. Just because it's made and all the physics should work, sometimes it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. Like you can make gunpowder. And you could be like, yeah, this stuff will explode if I light it on fire. If you light it on fire, it doesn't act the same way. And with it, within that, um, is it a is it a case where since since you mentioned since you mentioned that there is a bit of an that there is a ebb and flow when it comes to the strength of certain magics, is it is it one of those things that people who are properly trained can can um, see and be aware of? Uh, certain certain people are more in tune than others. Uh, you may have a magic user that's like you know, all powerful and all this kind of stuff, but is not in tune with the ebb and flow of you know the great magic. And uh, that ebb and flow uh, will circulate and cycle between uh, certain entities, powers, people. So it's it's never in one place at one time. And there'll be like a chain of events that will happen that will cause you know a rise of great power in one region. But not affect a different one. Yeah. Now, with the, with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, I did I on the Indiegogo page there there was the there was the presentation of the of the cast in that in that very wide shot kind of approach. Um, mm -hmm. How 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 easy or difficult is it to bal to balance a cast of that size? Given the uh, page, given the page count that you have to work with. Well, uh, the way that the story works is very much like Dragon Ball. We start on an adventure and we end up following our main characters once we introduce them uh, in issue two, and we follow them. And as we roll along, that's how we're going to get to meet all these other characters. All right, I can, I can certainly, I can certainly see that. And yeah. Um. Obviously. I don't. Th I seriously doubt that you're gonna fall into the same trap that say Robert Jordan did, where he kept at he kept adding new characters to the bunch. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Like it's uh, the the main characters are you know the yeah, Trigger the Chicken, Sissick the Snake, and uh, Nitto the 15 year old kid. Like they're that's that's the core group. And and obviously you know whoever they interact with during whatever arc, you know that's that's who they're interacting with. And when it comes to those three, a lot a lot of stories that ha that have that have the focus on three characters set them up in a kind of id ego um, super ego setup. Um, Star both Star Trek and Star Wars kind of have kind of have that trinity. Mm -hmm. um, is that is that some is that trinity something that could apply as well to the main three characters that you have? So uh, the the main characters uh, that we go the adventure on, like uh, Catmaster Lee, also plays a big part in this. Uh, essentially, Catmaster Lee, Trigger the Chicken, and Sissick the Snake are the father figures for Nitto. He, they are pretty much the only people that he's ever really known growing up in this you know magical jungle forest, and uh, each one will cycle out on the role of you know father, uncle, brother. And uh, Sissick and Nitto, like, they're always fighting and scrapping each other because that would be, like, the brother aspect because the snake is trying to teach him how to fight and because uh, the snake is kind of the only one who can actually go kind of toe-to-toe -to -toe with the kid because they're both, you know, super strong, uh, they always end up 
you know, beating the crap out of each other because it escalates because they, you know, as brothers do, they get into it, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's it starts off like, hey, let me show you something. Oh, let me try this on you. Hey, that hurts. And like, hey, man, stop. Like, <laughs> the, the constant escalation. Yeah. Um, it it only... T and, of course... Like I've I've been I've been in that I've been in that situation more times than I'd like to count, and I've received, yeah. I've sent that situation more times than I'd care, more times than I'd care to count. Um, yeah. It's it's all it's all fun in games until someone drops the gloves. That that's it exactly. And uh, with with Nitto and Sisik, like the thing is, is that Sisik is teaching them how to use quote unquote martial arts, but because he's a snake, you know, there's only so much you can actually teach him. So he can't teach him proper footwork or anything like that. So, you know, he kind of always has an advantage that way because he's like, yeah, I taught you how to strike. I taught you how to punch, but your footwork game sucks and I'm always going to kick your ass on that. <laughs> and, you know, Nate will well, teach me some footwork things. Like, dude, I don't have feet. I can't teach you. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, the, when you meant, when you mentioned Nito being, being in, being in this, being in this um, jungle, in a very isolated state. What I'm somewhat rem what I'm somewhat reminded of is um, Goku during the early days of Dragon Ball. Yeah, that, hang on. Would that be would that be fairly accurate? Yeah, picture like Goku crossed with Tarzan. You know, not that hard. Not that hard. To, not that hard to do, honestly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you know, growing up in the jungle, isolated, all this kind of stuff, and then when he actually starts interacting with people, because he's you know. He's only really interacted with a giant snake, a chicken, and an old cat, you know, stink humanoid. And he's not exactly the most tactful. So he's going to be learning lessons along the way, you know, like manners, things you can't do. And like, you know, him being abrupt in certain scenarios, like uh, it's not going to play out the way that he plans it to, you know. Just that uh, classic, uh, what is it, the, you know, fish out of water. Yeah. Um, I was going to say... Oh. And a common thing with a, a common thing with a lot of with a lot of the of those approaches is the is the rival, and in a lot of cases, have, having a, having a difference between someone who's street smart but not book smart, and the and a rival who is um, vice versa. Um, is that a tradition that you're that's carrying on in Kaios? Oh yeah. So trigger the chicken. He would be the street smart of the group. Uh, he's uh, uh, the, <laughs> as I like to call him. He literally is foul mouth. So if he swears, it's just replaced with like cluck or buck. So <laughs> that way, you know, it, I can still get that effect across, but still, you know, keep it clean, so to speak. Uh, plus the idea of you know uh, some kid reading it and be like mother clucker and like you know the parent can't get mad at them for saying that but at the same time it's you know I know what I'm you're saying. I'm pretty sure a lot of people got away got away with a lot of curse words by just replacing it with frack. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So playing to that trope and uh, yeah, trigger kind of plays the uh, no nonsense uncle but at the same time he's got his own faults he's got his own problems like he likes gambling he likes smoking like the thing with him too is uh he he's got kind of a curse on him and his curse is that he's always smoking he is chain smoking non-stop like even when he's asleep passed out snoring he's got a cig cigar in his mouth and once it goes out he'll he'll reach and grab another one and it'll you know be lit ready to go so he's always smoking and, uh, yeah, he likes gambling, like getting into trouble. Uh, he's got the Napoleon complex, so, you know, he'll be the first one out there, like, calling people on. And, uh, he's willing to throw down, but, you know, he's a chicken. There's only so much he can do. Yeah, then, they, then again, um, then again, pe people, will f people will find a way to work around, to work around their, um, disadvantages. Oh, yeah. Oh. Especially, especially given what you mentioned before about magic being um, more or less everywhere. Yeah. And I, I, that's that's also the reason why why I asked about the whole animal thing because I'm pretty sh I'm pretty sure even they have their own brands of magic that they're that they're adept with. Oh yeah. So like uh, with with Sisic, you know, like we got the classic snake tropes, you know, like uh, 
you know, he's got like hypnotize, he's got venom, he's got, you know, things that he could use that way. Like if you picture like an RPG video game and they get into battle mode and you have the, you know, the, the sections broken off and you're fighting the main bad guy and you scroll through your list of moves and attacks, that's kind of what they got. Yeah. Um, and with with that with that kind of thing in mind, with that kind of thing in mind, the other thing I was curious about is issue four is sixty four pages and issue two is only going to be um, thirty two. Um, yeah. Is thirty two is there when it comes to subsequent issues, is thirty two going to be the magic number that you're going to be working around? So uh, the reason I picked thirty two is uh, it, it funny enough it comes down to weight. Uh, because I'm living in Canada and doing crowdfunding, uh, there's a very specific weight limit that we have here. And if we go over that, the shipping costs double. So my original plan was I wanted to do uh, either a 48 or 52 page book for the next one. But then when I actually started weighing out the book of sending out book one, that's 64 pages and another book that's 64 pages plus any additional stuff on top of it, stickers, cards, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I was like, man, I'm going to bump over that weight limit real fast. So I had to find a nice page count, and 32 works out perfectly because if I do two 32-page books, that's two 64 books or, you know, a 124-page uh, graphic novel. And that weight limit is still under uh, the cheapest shipping rate that I can get. All right, I, I, can, certainly see, I can certainly see that. And I do... I, um... <clears throat> I do. I do wish the be the best of luck when it comes to when it comes to dealing with um, that particular part of the process with shipping because that's no matter what country you're in, it's not fun. Yeah, so it's always a pain in the butt. Like uh, uh, for the campaign, I'm actually dealing my, with my tiers different than I did the first time. Uh, usually, everybody when they do their campaign, uh, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, they have a bunch of stretch goals. You know, if we hit this mark, then you get this. You hit this mark, you get this. Uh, if I do that and it so happens to blow up and then I start giving out more stuff that ends up weighing more, I, I you know, <laughs> I screwed myself. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna have set bundle tiers and as the bundle tiers go down, that's what you get per, per bundle tier and that's just the way it's gonna be. Oh, I, I, will, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how that develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the ma at madness at play here. Oh, thanks for having me on. And you know what? Uh, uh, really awesome questions too, with the whole magic aspect and like uh, getting into that stuff. More more people are usually more focused on uh, the characters and what's going on as opposed to getting into the actual world development side of it. So, yeah, yeah I, thanks for asking those. I, I wanted to f I wanted to focus on that because for a lot of writers they um, create they create a world and then create characters and um, you can and I tr I try I want it's it's difficult to to talk about it to talk about characters too much because I don't want to give away too much detail or too or anything too spoilery when I do these kind of things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's easier to talk about the world. And, and how the world operates and uh, how that world is going to develop as the characters go through it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, with, and um, of course, anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As oh, I thanks. often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> nice. Oh, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>